Hello everybody, you know you love it, you know you love an overrated video. Now I've got to tell you something, I've had a lot of stress with my overrated video. I put this video up, the 10 most overrated bands in, in human history, or something ridiculous like that. I come back an hour later, it's got 40,000 views, right? Everybody's coming steaming in, especially people upset by their, their bands getting a good kicking. Now, I never said they were bad bands. I said they were overrated. They were either overrated by the critics, by music history, or by the fans. And there's a, there are fans out there for certain bands, and they will not tolerate any sort of criticism of their band. Any, any way whatsoever. Right? So, um, so many people came to the channel to watch that video. And I, I go through the comments, and the, I've got to be honest, the comments did my head in. There was so much comments, and there was so much love coming through, which is wonderful, but so much hate as well. I'm actually going to do a video on it. It'll be out this Sunday, Philosophy Sunday. I know no one's going to watch this video, but I'm going to restate the intentions of this channel and try and get a little bit on, back on track. I have been, you know, a little bit sideswept by the sudden views that that, that one got, because of what has happened in the past. It's been in safe territory. It's just been, oh yeah, this is great. This one was, was different, but I thought I've got to come back with another over, overrated video, you know, discussion. Now these 10 aren't ranked, and I'll tell you why they're not ranked, because this is not my 10. This is your 10. I went down those comments and everybody should have said, when well, every time they said, you should have put this band in, I wrote it down. And, and it wasn't scientific. I didn't want to rank it, but a certain set of, uh, artists came out. Some of these artists I know something about, some of them I know nothing about, and I thought, thought shall I research it or shall I just give my opinion? So what you're going to get is the 10, I think these are the most 10 common um, bands or artists that people felt were overrated that has some, you know, relation to this channel. If there's anyone, you know, going on about how they hate Nicki Minaj or something, I ain't going to go and talk about all that, and there was a little bit of that. But, um, you know, the bands that would be sort of associated, proggy bands, classic rock bands, you know, you know, bands, you know, rock artists. And we've got a whole bunch list here of uh, bands, 10 of them, not in any particular order, but 10 nonetheless. So don't think I'm going 10 to 1, right? So if, if when I get to the, the, the last one on the list, it was the one that everyone said more than any other. A one person put the band that's at number one, they just, they just, they just controlled C, controlled V, and just filled it up with the name of that band. So I thought, I've got to put them at number one, even if it's just because that guy went to so much effort putting the same name over and over again. So what have I got at number 10? At number 10, I've got Tool. There was a number of people saying that Tool's overrated. Now, what's my take on Tool? Tool are one of the modern progressive rock bands that are massively successful. Dream Theatre would be another one. You've got Porcupine Tree, but I'm pretty sure Tool are way bigger than Porcupine Tree. They wave the flag for prog, albeit a bit of prog metal, but Tool have created their own brand of, of, of prog metal. Um, their, their influence is coming a lot more from, say, King Crimson, a bit of rush, you know, it's a little bit darker and churnier and it's got a little bit of a sort of indie sound to it. Now, um, when Tool sort of reached their peak, I had not discovered them and so I felt I needed to go and get an album by them, so I did and I went out and got Lateralus, which is um, the big famous album and I put it on in the car, put it on in, you know, in the house, started listening to it and I did not like it. And I remember sat there thinking, I should like this. It's got all this proggy stuff. The musicians are great players. Danny Carey's a great drummer. He's doing really interesting things. Why don't I like it? It was this sort of sludgy, you know, never get out of sec second gear, moody sort of tribally sound. And I don't care if it's in some funny time signature. I, you know, I'm not that, you know, swayed by virtuosity that, you know, the fact that it's skillful is going to make me like it. And so... You know, I didn't understand why people like them, and so many of my friends um, love Tool. Now, last year when they were on tour, uh, a friend of mine he emailed me and said, look, I've got a free ticket to come and see Tool. Do you want to go? And I said, look, I'm just not going to enjoy it. And I didn't go, even though I had a free ticket offered me. That's how much I don't like Tool. Is Danny Carey a brilliant drummer? Yes. If you watch me talking about this new King Crimson, I'm very interested to hear him play that King Crimson stuff because I know he loves it and I know he can play it and it'd be interesting to have a guy from a band that size bringing the focus down to a band like King Crimson. I think that's fantastic. Anyway, um, 
I've got to be honest, I listened to Lateralus. I uh, dipped into the albums that came on. I haven't listened to the earlier albums. And so, more recently, I went and listened to the earlier albums. And the first album, I can't remember what it's called. Um, I'm sure you'll shout at me, but I'm not at all fun. I like that a lot more than Lateralus. I, I feel that there's a sort of... The, the sound that they got famous for... In, in the early days, it's a little bit more... It just sounds more like a band in a room. It sounds more like... Um, I'm sure they are playing it, but I don't... I, I don't know what it is I don't like about them. It just sounds... There's just no... There's nothing in between the cracks. There's, there's nothing that feels like... It, it's angsty, but that's, it's because they're all... Uh, I'm not a big fan of moodiness, right? I'm not a big fan of moodiness. My favourite my, my favorite thrash metal band was Anthrax. Because Anthrax sounded like they were having a laugh. You know, uh, bands that have to be moody, like Radiohead, to try and get, you know, um, you know, to be perceived as serious. I'm, I always mistrust that. Um, I don't think Tool are overrated. I think they're a great band. I just don't think I like them, and I don't know what it is why I don't like them. I don't know what it is. It's really... I, I wish I could come up with something better, better for you, than that but I can't I have listened to them a lot I wish I did like them but I don't like them um, I'm not a massive fan of Dream Theater either but I could tell you that's because it just sounds like cock rock with some clever stuff stuck in it and that's in the vocals and that sort of screamy you know it feels like chicken tonight you know that sort of vocal sound these are all English references only a, only a somebody of a certain age will understand like you know, it, it, like Chicken Tonight, which was an advert that was out where uh, this rock band went, Chicken Tonight! You know, anyway. Oh, oh my God. This is me stumbling around. But Tool, many people thought they were overrated. Uh, they're very competent. Is there something wrong with them? You know, if there's a lot of people sort of recognise it, I'm sure people say, yeah, Andy, I feel exactly the same. They just sound a little bit dull and there's nothing in there that make, gives them a sound which I go, you know, oh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, they're like, you know, punky but with slap bass and, you know, not, what's tall? Don't know. I don't know what to say about that one. It might be like this for a lot of this video, this, but, this, but the, the fact is everyone will still come and watch it because they want to see what the uh, overrated bands are. That's chosen by you guys, so don't blame me. Right, I'm trying to do another overrated video here. But I'm trying to do it so I don't get the heat this time. You know, don't blame me. But the thing is, I'm, I'm you know, like, get yeah, tall. I, they are a massive band. And I'm, why don't I think they're overrated? It's because I, I think maybe there's something about them that I don't get. But I could say that about every band that I think is overrated, couldn't I? I'm not a massive fan. Yeah, they are overrated. They're, come on, Andy. Wait, what are you doing? Get back in the fight. Come on, yeah. Tool overrated. Sludgy, boring stuff. Loads of tribal drums going on while somebody just witters on about how bad life is and he just goes on and he never gets out of second gear. That's my take on Tool. Right, there we go. Number nine, Pearl Jam. The most rubbish of all the <laughs> grunge bands. Not Soundgarden, not Stone Temple Pilots even. They were the Seattle band, but you know what I'm saying. Not um, Alice in Chains, love Alice in Chains, and not even Nirvana. Right, a band that made, you know, a couple of good albums in the early days, but, you know, but covered with awful pentatonic, you know, mediocre guitar playing all over it. Jeremy's a great song, yes, it's a great song, but he does say the C word in it. I don't like that type of swearing. And then once they get past that, they just fall into this sort of endless albums of sort of just turgid, you know, country americana -y rock. And I hate Americana! They are, they do do Americana now, because I haven't listened to it that much. I've assumed, I heard it, I'm sure years ago I heard an album by them and it sounded like bloody America, Americana. I hate Americana! Right? If you ever see a bloke with a beard, a bowler hat and a waistcoat playing a banjo, do not trust that man. 
right? That is a middle class person trying to grab at something that they think is authentic because they're a posh boy. That's what that is. There's billions of them out there and they always end up playing the Americana. Do you know why? Because it's easy to play. That's why. But people will go, mmm, it's really good. Yeah, I really like that. Americana's the worst thing in the world. That's why I never talk about the band. The band's a good band. Dylan's great. But the trouble is that they, that their legacy is the worst bloody music on the planet, Americana. It's all Americana. Everything's Americana, right? Jazz, blues, heavy metal, soul, R&B, funk. It's all Americana. James Brown is Americana, right? He's more Americana than some middle-class posh boy with a beard and a waistcoat singing something with three chords about how he used to you know, was out in the countryside picking cotton. I was like, oh, I hate the whole thing. I hate it. I hate Americana. And that's where Pearl Jam, they, they've just got that sound. They've got that, they've got that twang. And then they just have a, how many, how many years have they been going? And, you know, why are they still going? Right? I quite like Pearl Jam. They're, they're on, on, on 10, of course, is a great album. It's a classic album. I, I was just, that was a bit of ranting. I could always rant for you. I, I thought they want the ranting, but they've got to understand the ranting's tongue in cheek. That was a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, this is my thoughts on Pearl This is the real th thoughts on Pearl Jam. I was on tour once, back in the old days, when I was playing with old rock god Robert Plant. So we were doing all these great big gigs, and we were hoi polloing it with the famous people back then. And, um, we were in Norway or somewhere, and we were playing at the same place that Pearl Jam was playing. Of course, the rock gods, they all get to Eddie Vedder and Rock Plant, they all meet up. And because they all meet up, we get handed a whole bunch of um, Access All Areas passes to, um, you know, go and see and meet Pearl Jam, which I did. Now, I have no memory of that at all. I know I did. I can remember going there, and I can remember sat chatting to my mate while they were playing nothing they played impinged on me whatsoever and i may have gone backstage some people said i did go backstage afterwards maybe i'd had a drink because i used to drink back then but i can't remember anything about it so i can i went to see bill pearl jam access all areas artist pass and i have no recollection of it that is how much they impinged on my memory Let's move on to number eight on the overrated list of overrated bands. This is, remember, it's not mine. Pearl Jam wasn't mine. I wouldn't have put them on the list, right? But uh, I think, you know, maybe if they hadn't been around in the Seattle grunge era, maybe they might not be as you know, famous as they are now. But people love Pearl Jam, don't they? So I don't know. Number eight, Rolling Stones. I'm not a fan of the Rolling Stones. <laughs> um, I can remember he did an interview with John McLaughlin. Now, John McLaughlin started off on the London um, scene, and he was a virtuoso guitarist, working with a whole bunch of virtuoso guitarists, people like, you know, Clapton, Jeff Beck, Ginger Baker, Jack Brute, Dick Hextall Smith, Graham Bond, Brian Auger. What a bloody genius musician he is. He still is one of the great, you know, organists, incredible musicians. And you got people like Big Jim Sullivan. You've got a whole bunch of these incredible musicians playing around Alexis Corner. These are the monsters. And around that are these posh boys. It's, it's this thing again. These posh boys who, you know, want to sort of downplay their poshness by getting on stage and acting like a, a black R&B artist. You know, even to the point of, of you know, doing all this and doing that. You know, I was chatting to a professor about music history the other day and they said something which really struck me. The Rolling Stones is, is blackface. Not that this is, it's not saying it's cultural appropriation. It's saying what minstrel shows did, what the actual minstrel shows did, the thing that sold and that was a big success that everybody loved, that thing that they did, the dances and the pouting and, the, and the, all this is what the Rolling Stones do, right? Now, I would argue that we, this cannot be denied because the Ro Rolling Stones are the archetypal rock band. All the bands that follow, the Beatles, for all their influence, never became the archetypal rock band. A rock band is someone with long hair, with a guitar slung low, swinging a Jack Daniels, walking around, patting on the stage, you know, um, with dirty rock lifts, living the lifestyle, you know, you know, 
breaking stuff, destroying stuff, taking too many drugs, over all that. That's the Stones, the bad boys. Now, the Beatles were the real bad boys. You do know if there was a fight between the Beatles and the Stones, you know who's going to win. Right, it's the Scousers are going to win. The working class Scousers are just going to, they're just going to lamp, as we say here in the Black Country. They would have lamped them, lamped them to the ground. That's what we would have had there. Now, let me argue for the Rolling Stones. Brian Jones, he's the, he's the real musician in that band, isn't he? He's the guy, he's the one with the ideas. He's this, the, Brian Jones is pushing them. And he's bringing out all this incredible stuff. So things like, um, you know, Satisfaction, you know, this is the beginnings of rock music. Um, Jumping Jack Flash, one of the greatest riffs of all time. And then you get all this opulence and things like Gimme Shelter. When I put on Gimme Shelter and you've got that singer, that soul singer singing, and I think she had a miscarriage, didn't she? She actually did that vocal. It's Gimme Shelter is just sublime. This is one of the greatest songs in rock music history. Now I'm saying this because I have given the Rolling Stones a rough ride, you know, on this channel. They're, I know those songs are brilliant. Um, things like It's Only in Rock and Roll, I love it. I do, there's songs I do like by the Rolling Stones. I've told the story of, you know, uh, you know, I got Start Me Up when I was a kid, it was okay and I quite liked that. So I said, well, which one's the best album? I went and got Exile on Main Street and I hated it. Hated it. Um, now, Going back to John McLaughlin, so John McLaughlin's in this scene and he's aware of what the Rolling Stones were. They were the posh boys that wanted to play a bit of blues. And I think he said something like, um, I remember them back in the old days. They were out of tune and out of time then and they're out of tune and out of time now. <laughs> and I think there's a sound there that we all know. Now, I think it's unfair. Um, there's no way I would say the Rolling Stones uh, are overrated. I think they've, there's too many incredible songs there that are just sublime. They never, they've never really made a bad album, um, I don't think. Um, it, even in, when they did things like Undercover, I can remember in the 80s when they did Undercover and they did things like Harlem Shuffle. You know, they're, they're a good rhythm and blues band. You know, that's the, the bottom line. They can always do that. You know, they've gone down a few, you know, Twists and turn. The, you know, they're like 80 years old. The album, you know, off of them are dead. The album that came out last year, it's a good album. So I'm not going to say they're overrated. Um, I just think um, what you've got with the Stones is rock bands that came in after had, had more competence. The Led Zeppelins and the Creeps and the Black Sabbaths and the Deep Purples and Freeze. They had a lot more competence than um, uh, the Stones. And I think... Us fans of rock music, we hear that. But if somebody wants to hear dirty, something dirty and gutsy, then get an Aerosmith album. No, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> Please, I'm joking. And I've got how long? I was 15 minutes. I think I'm going to get a move on. Right, this is disgusting. People put this one over and over again. Prince. They said Prince was overrated. Right, so this guy that can play about 40 instruments. And in some cases, really play. Like he can really play. Freshed with his voice. This person who is absolutely iconic in their images and they changed their image and was always had a, had a, had a look that you can parody. You know, has a way about it that you can parody. You know, Dave Chappelle's um, parody of Prince is incredible because Prince is so iconic. This is a guy that could go out on stage and although he was a little fella, he could magnetically command the stage on a stage show that nobody had ever seen. A stage show that included fire, that included him driving on stage in a car, and then he would get out and play basketball, and he would throw a basketball across the room, and it would go in the hoop, because he had so much confidence, he knew he was going to hit the target, even though he's got 50,000 people watching him. Right, and then he's going to start performing, and when he performs, he is going to drop down into the splits, and then with his legs like that, he's going to pull them up and stand back up onto the mic, and then do a guitar solo that sounds like somewhere between Carlos Santana and Jim. Jimi Hendrix and this is the guy that's going to have on his debut album play all the instruments right and write songs that are so classic that people like um, Chaka Khan could go to number one but also Sinead O'Connor can go to number one or the 
Bangles can go to number one with his songs because his songs are so ridiculous. Then he's going to come out with a series of iconic albums where he takes, you know, black American rhythm and blues soul music and he moves it into the 80s by combining it into a very intelligent way with electro music. Moving up to an album that becomes the biggest selling album of the 1980s, or one of them, Purple Rain, which where he also now moves into film and he has a hit film as well. It's a soundtrack to a hit and he acts in it and he pulls that all off. Then he goes on to make one genius album after the other. You know, he makes um, um, uh, Around the World in a Day, he makes um, Sign of the Times, a double album of sheer genius that just does not let up. He makes Love Sexy, he makes Parade, right? When I was a kid, I was a rocker. When Purple Rain came out, I didn't like it because I reacted to Gavin. Yeah, he was playing the guitar. He's playing the guitar and he's got a few rock riffs every now and then. But this is pop music. It's pop music, you know. And then I went round to someone's house and they put Parade on. And my jaw hit the floor. This wasn't soul. This wasn't pop music. This was something else. This was mad orchestral, psychedelic insanity. By, by a guy that was in total control of every aspect of the music compositionally, harmonically, he's got all the music theory, he knows how to voice for brass. This guy was probably the greatest musical genius to come out of popular music in the last 50 years. No, he's not overrated. Idiotic, right? And even on his worst albums, and you've got to remember, he had problems with the record company. He did made a ton of albums just to get out of this. He took the mickey. He, he, he did stuff that he knew was deliberately mediocre, <laughs> you know, to try and prove a point. And I have that album, the big triple album that he made to get out of the car. It's, yes, it is not Parade. It is not Sign of the Times, but it's still full of incredible stuff. And even if you get a middling album like Diamonds and Pearls and put that on and then you, you know, um, you hear a track like Diamonds and Pearls, you go, oh my God, this guy was a genius. I absolutely love Prince. Anyone who says he's overrated it just does not know what they're talking about. And I guess they're coming from a sort of rock prejudice against that type of music, which it comes out of ignorance, you know, because rock people think that their rock bands are the best musicians in the world, but they're not. The best musicians are jazz musicians who have that background. And he was a jazz musician. And that is why when you watch the Love Sexy tour, when they drop into Charlie Parker like that, right, that is because that is where he was pulling from. This guy was something else. Prince was something else. And when he died, I was upset because this was a terrible thing because we really were dealing with one of the greatest musicians of all time. Really was. At every single level. Now, could he play the guitar like Alan Holdsworth? No. But the thing was, when you look at the totality of what he could do, it, it was jaw-dropping. It's George. I remember when he did the Batman soundtrack, an incredible soundtrack, and uh, they were. Uh, they, you find it on the net somewhere. He, um, he. Uh, I might even put it in here, but I bet he'll demonetize a bloody video. But I'll try. Um, <laughs> He starts playing slap bass. It's unbelievable. Prince, I absolutely love him. And number six, you lot said that ACDC are overrated. What is wrong with you? They're simple. They do the same thing over and over again. The drum beat's just the same drum beat, right? It's all the same lyrics, and the lyrics are just rubbish, just about, like, getting drunk and womanising. And um, it's just really simplistic, and they never did anything but that, and they never changed it, right? You don't know anything. You've shown your ignorance up. Um, ACDC are the nuclear physicians of rock music, right? Um... If I had to play some in co complex jazz fusion or audition to be the drummer in ACDC, I would be scared because that, to nail that in ACDC, you've got to be so consistent, right? And there's no error, right? That's what the drums are like. Um, Malcolm Young came up with riffs that, yes, only contained E, A, and D, but they're iconic. You know how hard that is. You know, you get three chords and try and come up for the last... 50 years with a million riffs that if I pick, pick the guitar up now and go no I'll get in a minute here we go start 
in the wrong key. And you know what song that is because that is a genius riff and it is G, D and A. That's all that's there. But I'm going to admit that D does have an F sharp in the bass, doesn't it? Yes, the Angus knows what he's doing. A brilliant blues guitarist, Angus. Brilliant blues guitarist. Um, ACDC, when you listen to what they do, and I'm going to, I've said this so many times, I've said so many stories about ACDC, because I think they absolutely are just incredible. If you want to listen to rock music, if you want to be a rock musician, you have to listen to ACDC, you have to unlock what the hell's going on with that band, and what makes it so brilliant. Um, the orchestration, the arrangements, it's not simple at all. Um, and they know how to control and make great artistic statements with what they're doing. There's always, they seem to be unknowing, but they're knowing. And I'm going to give you an example like this. So in, in, in obviously in 1980, February 1980, Bon Scott dies. ACDC at the peak of their powers at that point. Absolutely just about to take over the world. So they get back into the studio, they get another singer in, and this is, should be death to a band. You know, Bon Scott, this charismatic, incredible guy that just held the band together with this dynamic between him and Angus Schultz that has never been replicated really uh, in, um, in rock music. He never had that feeling of, sort of like a, the, 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 the experienced father with the naughty child. <laughs> it's an insane, insane dynamic. And he's gone. So they go back into the studio, and what do they come out with? You know, any other band would go, right, we've really got to show that we can do what, what we did before, right? And you think that's what they did on Back in Black, but they didn't, because I remember it coming out. I see it's got a new album out, they've got a new singer. Oh, let's go down. Went down to the shop, there is, it's pitch black. Bon Scott's dead, and the album's black. This is ACDC, they're the fun band. You know, they're the ones that sing about drinking and fornicating, you know. And, uh, you know, it's like, this is Black Album, and the original album, the vinyl, the, the, it, now on the CD, it's like white lettering, but this was just embossed, you had to feel the word. This is, this is ACDC, this has gone all dark, like a Black Sabbath album. And you put it on, we took it and put it on, and what do you hear, what's the first thing you hear? A death knell, a bell, bang, bang, bang. And then this arpeggiated guitar comes in. And you think, oh my god, the last album was Highway to Hell, and on the title track, Bon Scott was saying he's on a highway to hell. And now, what have we got here? This new singer's coming out, we've got a death now, we've got this doomy, and it comes in like a prog. Down, 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 down. Down, da, da, da. And then this new thing, and he's, he's all like godlike, which ACDC could do, they did it on Let There Be Rock, and he goes, rolling thunder, a pouring rain, but in this credible rage, coming out like a hurricane. You know, and this is their tribute to Bon Scott. This is the power of Bon embodied on this record. You know, and it's Hell's Bells, you know, wherever Bon is, it's where he was singing about the place he wanted to be. It's just absolute genius. And they can control rock music. Rock music's a thing. And it's, it's, it's not about virtuosity. And it's not just about expressing yourself. There's an artistry to it. And ACDC have, have probably understand it more than any other band. And I think it's the fact that they're Australian. They're not, they're not British. So it's not that British take on you know American rhythm and blues. And it's not that American take on, on their own you know, ACDC have their own take on it, and and um, anyway, I'm going to move on. No, ACDC, there's no way you can call them overrated. So, what have we got so far? Um, I'll go through at the end, and I'll do that. End. Number five, people said Led Zeppelin are overrated. Led Zeppelin, I mean, the thing is, they didn't write any of their songs, did they? They just just did old, and then they didn't give any credit to these old blues artists. They pretended it was their songs. It was just their, and it's just old tired riffs that they've done over and over again. And when you listen to them live, it was always a bit patchy and scrappy and all that type of stuff. Right now, um, Led Zeppelin, when I was a kid, was probably my favourite band, I think. Uh, I was really into rock music and um, of the heavy bands, you know, I went from sort of Motorhead to Iron Maiden. Eventually, when I discovered Led Zeppelin, it opened up the world to me. Um, now, uh, Led Zeppelin a sort of um, the rock music, like I said, you know what I said about thing about, you know, Blackface and Rolling Stones? 
That is what rock music is. You have to understand that. British people, often very middle class British people, got enthralled with American blues and they electrified it. And we had the Marshall amplifier and that is the sound. You know, talk about cultural appropriation. Yes, you believe it. Now, any these guys started to study the blues and they became aware that there's these songs that the blues singers sung were handed down to them. All right, um, so if you, if, so, say you've discovered Robert Johnson, you listen to all those songs, but those songs are coming out of Leroy Carr. They're coming out of Booker White. They're coming, you know, Robert Johnson did not write those songs. These songs go back to the beginning of time. And if you're studying the blues and you're ensconcing it, and you're going through a time in the 1960s that we don't understand, because this is the point where the civil rights movement is moving in and everyone is embracing everybody else. And they're opening up for ideas that come from, you know, Afro-American people, from gay people. This is it's an opening up. And these people at the time thought there was nothing wrong with standing up and singing these blues songs. And I believe there was nothing wrong. I think it was, it was building a bridge between people that was so powerful that it creates the era. And the era that we went through where all those rights were given to people is the era of rock music. They go hand in hand, right? So Led Zeppelin are working within a tradition. Now, uh, when you listen to Led Zeppelin, right, say they're ripping off Muddy Waters or howling wolf or whatever it is they're ripping off right maybe they're they're not they are playing that tune now did they put um their a credit on them now the thing is is that you've got to understand if 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 there's like um a blues artist and their credit should go to them right i could promise you that that blues artist didn't fully wrote these songs this this goes back and back all right and the way the, the way the um, the record industry works is is if you're going to make money out of it, and Led Zeppelin were one of the bands to actually get control. If if Peter Grant hadn't got control over Led Zeppelin, they would have ended up like the Jimi Hendrix experience, and those guys came out with nothing. And it's not it, it does not keep the thing going. The reason why we have all this incredible jazz fusion. Right, is because on Atlantic Records, Led Zeppelin making so much money that it it would enable you know Armit Erkin to then put that money into obscure prog or jazz or whatever it is, right? And so um, that's the way publishing works. Now, of course, as time went on, you know they changed the things, and a lot of people now get paid, you know, and they've been challenged on it. But you, to me, they deserve the credit because. When you listen to a whole lot of love, which is need some love, you know, that's what it is. Because Robert's sort of bringing in those vocals, but we know what a whole lot of love, and it's... Bass comes in. That's what it is. And then bam, bam. That's the thing that we were all blown away by. It wasn't the melody and the chord progression. That's what Led Zeppelin came up with and no one had done it before. Well, they had done it a little bit before, but what Led Zeppelin did is they, they did it in a way that no one else had done it. And they popularised it. And a lot of that's to do with Jimmy Page's Jimmy Page's genius is, is in the studio. But to write Led, Zop, Led Zeppelin off that they only did that is absolutely ridiculous. On the first album, they are doing all sorts of different things. And it, they, they, they are extending the form. These long solos, these sort of extemporizations. No blues artist did that. If you listen to Days of Confused, no blues artist ever did that. That's what Led Zeppelin did. That when you get to Stay Away to Heaven or you get to Over the Hills and Far Away or you get to um, Led Zepp 3 or the whole of that album or Cashmere, this is not derivative whatsoever. So no, I will not have it that number five that Led Zeppelin are overrated in any way whatsoever. And the other thing with Led Zeppelin I think is astonishing is um, my least favourite album by Led Zeppelin is In Through the Outdoor. And I can criticise that album I did a gig yesterday at a prog festival. I got chatting to a guy called Jeff Cooper, who um, I've just name checked on here, and he's a he's a he's a big fan of a lot of the bands, and he's a very knowledgeable guy. And he was saying, and I respect his opinion, and I know where he's coming from. He was saying my favourite Zepp album is In Through the Outdoor, because In Through the Outdoor is a fantastic album. It's a brilliant album, but all the old other albums are brilliant. Led Zeppelin, it, their quality on their albums is incredible. 
absolutely incredible. Um, they just do not let up. They don't put a foot wrong. Right? There's no missteps. There's no. There's nothing. There's nothing. There's ne nothing that you ever listen to. And go. Oh my God! This is like. What did they do this for? What some other other bands do? Why did they go down this? They never do that. So I will not have led, that the Led Zeppelin are overrated. But you guys thought they were overrated. So I I, I respect that. I got no problem with that. Right. At number four. And this is just a list, I'm not ranking this. Um, I've got the Red Hot Chili Peppers. <laughs> now, this is a troublesome one for me. In the 1980s, I was a jazz snob. I was listening to Keith Jack, Jarrett, Jan Garbrecht, all the ECM stuff, a lot of free jazz. I thought it was very clever. I thought it was very intellectual. I'd, 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 I'd sold my Judas Priest albums and my ACDC albums much to my latest regret, but I, I didn't regret it then because I had gone up in the world and I was a very erudite young man that was listening to very intellectual music and I had no time for this rock music that was out there. No time at all. Um, and then David Lee Roth brought out Eat Em and Smile and I'd been a big Vi fan and my mate, when I listened to it and I thought, that, that is cool, but no, I'm not into this type of stuff. And then a friend of mine said, do you want to come and see the Red Hot Chili Peppers? This is around about 1987, right? And um, I said, no, I don't think I like the sound of that. And he went. He comes back the next day and he's going, I could not believe what I saw. He said, this was like punk and funk mixed together. He said, the guys were doing cartwheels. They were naked on stage. He said, he'd never seen anything like it. It was so energetic. And it really was like a bolt of lightning had hit the music industry in the middle of the 1980s when everything was crap. Right? And I thought, this sounds pretty cool. You know, I'm listening to all this weird jazz. I'm not listening to any, like, 80s pop music now. I'm not listening to 80s rock music because I don't like Poison or Winger. I don't like any of this stuff, but this Red Hot Chili Pepper sounds cool. So I went out and got the album. By this time, and I actually decided, it took me a while to decide to do this, I went out and got Mother's Milk, which came out in 1988. And when I heard it, I could hear bits of, like, Parliament Funkadelic, James Brown, The Stooges. I could hear bits of Frank Zappa. I could hear all these influences. And it didn't seem to have this awful thing that the 1980s had. It was the first ray of light. And on that album, on the first track, he... Um, Anthony Kiedis lists a whole bunch of other bands like Firehose, 24 Seven Spies, Fishbone and I went and bought all those albums as well and they were incredible and Red Hot Chili Peppers brought me back in to rock music and popular music and it got me into and then I got into Public Enemy and dance music now I would not have worked as a musician if it wasn't for Red Hot Chili Peppers and the thing that impressed me more than anything else was at a time when bands were not re-exploring really virtuosity, or if they were, it was in a very po-faced intellectual way. He was an exuberant band, you know, an exuberant band that were fun, but were, but were virtuoso. You know, you know, Chad Smith and Flea and John Frusciante were virtuoso musicians like you hadn't really seen. You know, I can remember having a bootleg video uh, of uh, the Red Hot Chili Peppers and John Frusciante came out and played the instrumental section to Inca Rhodes. This guy could play. He was a virtuoso. Flea was, yeah, we've had Victor Wood and all these guys come out now, but back in the middle of the 80s, the idea of taking punk and then taking the slap bass from Larry Graham and combining it in a sort of this aggressive way is incredible. And Chad Smith was an out and out rock jobber, big John Bonham fan, but he was also a Meters fan and he could play the funk. And when people say, oh, you know, when they play the funk, it's not the funk, they're a funky band, right? They're not a funky band like the Meters, they're not a funky band like Earth, Wind and Fire, they're Red Hot Chili Peppers. I loved the 80s Red Hot Chili Peppers. Now the songs, the songs were rubbish. Every now and then they get a catchy hook. It wasn't about the songs. It was about their performance. It was about the exuberance. You know, and it's, it's like also, they were near the knuckle, weren't they? If you think about it, some of the song titles, I mean, we don't mention this, you know, some of like, you know, Catholic schoolgirls rule and, and uh, I want to party on your pussy. I have to keep going about this. Was This was, a, you know, did, did, they were writing the, the soundtrack for Epstein Island at this time, weren't they? That's another thing. They were near the knuckle, you know, coming out on stage, playing in the nude, you know, and then there was all the drugs. Hillel died of heroin overdose. And then um, they reach this peak and they have this Stevie Wonder song and they rework Stevie Wonder and it's in the charts and then suddenly this band that I was like in the, are getting, you know, some sort of um, uh, um, mass appeal. And then this new album's going to come out, Blood Sugar Sex Magic, and it's going to be a double album. And um, 
the first thing that comes out, give it away. Now, give it away to me sounds pretty funky. I think it's funky. I think I know about the funk. That's a pretty funky track. <laughs> you know, incredible production. They teamed up with, um, what's the name? Um, you know, Jeff Jam, Jeff Jam, I can't remember his name, the Def Jam producer. Oh, come on, Andy, just move on. And he's brought in this sound. It sounds incredible. Um, Keelis has tried to kick the heroin habit and he's written a, he's actually written a song. He's written a decent song. He's written something from the heart. Rather than just singing songs about, you know, their shenanigans, he's written it Under the Bridge. And Under the Bridge is a great song with that gospel vocal that comes in and it builds up, it's a bit stay with the heaven vibe. And that comes out, it's a huge hit record. And then the Riddell Chili Peppers, they change. <laughs> They change into the band that everyone else loves with the good songwriting, Californication and all those songs. Much better. Songwriting gets better. They're better. But I love, I just love the 80s Red Hot Chili Peppers. And to me, they're at their peak on Blood Shoe, Sex Magic. And the band means a lot to me. They really do. Does Anti Kiedis sing out of tune live? He does, yeah. He does, you know. But Anti Kiedis is not about his singing. Anthony Kiddis is one of the most beautiful men with that incredible body, half naked, jumping around the stage, standing on his head, all right, and rapping and shouting and being this focus. That, and when you zoom back, he's also, he's, he's almost like a modern day Iggy Pop. You know, that's, they look like the Stooges, but they don't sound like the Stooges. They sound like Parliament Funkadelic. It's like the best band in the world. The Stooges have discovered the funk. They'd be my favourite band. So no, I will not accept that the Red Hot Chili Peppers are overrated, although there's a stronger argument for them. Right, number three, I've got U2. <sighs> U2 are this big, fat, bloated rock band that's been around for like 50 years now. For all their post-punk roots, they have turned into this huge sort of rock establishment thing where, you know, Bono wants to save the world, he's going to go and hang out with the Pope and, you know, and he's going to, um, they're going to make millions and millions and spend it on these tours that make vast billions of money, which are bigger than any tours in the world. And it's all um, opulent and, uh, you know, over the top, you know, and um, what have they become? But in the early days of the 1980s, they were something else. And if you go back and listen, you know, um, to Sunday Bloody Sunday, what a hell of a song, or In the Name of Love. And the, and the Joshua Tree is one of the greatest rock albums ever made. It really is. And, you know, With or Without You is a sublime track. They've just been around for too long. That's their problem. And even when they've been around for too, you know, if you, if you go back 20 years and they're bringing out tracks like Beautiful Day or Actung Baby, all that stuff's great. And, and the quality hasn't dropped off there. They are a great band. What do you expect from them? I don't know what to say about you two. Um, at this stage, they are probably a little bit overrated. The, the sort of um, kudos and success that they've had is, is possibly because at a time when people wanted to rock but they could not buy into going just rocking out to like proper rock bands like Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin. U2 was like that softer option. They they, they had a, a occupied a position that the Foo Fighters. So I would say yes, at this point in time, U2, you know, looking at the whole thing, are perhaps overrated. And number two, we have Bruce Springsteen. Now, Bruce Springsteen is a good songwriter. He's an incredible performer. He's been around for a long time and he's written some good songs. It's not the sort of songs I'd like and I'm never ever going to listen to a Bruce Springsteen album, ever. It's sort of working class Bob Dylan. That is the best I can say, but I am talking about something that I really know nothing about here. It's not my thing at all. It's like Tom Petty, just not my thing at all. Right, now, there's something that I want to, a point I want to make, it's going to be my one point and then I will move on. I cannot hear the difference between Bon Jovi and what they do, song-wise, and um, Bruce Springsteen. When I listen to Living on a Prayer, those lyrics, they move me because it's a working class ode and it's, a, it's positive and it's about holding on against all the things. And it's a similar, similar sort of subject matter, similar vocal style. Now, Bon Jovi does not get spoken about in the same 
way as a Bruce Springsteen. You know why? Because they got big poodly hair, and on the video he's got like on a, a wire and he flies round, and they've got Richie Bad's sample, and he does some bloody good guitar solos, and Tika Torres is a cool drummer, and they're a cool rock band, and they're a rock band, and see, I would rather have... If Bruce Springsteen had the Richie Sambor guitar solos and they had the going about on the, on, the, on the wire and all that bit and the high kicks and all that bit, I'd like them more. But I know that the critics don't think that's good. You've got to have to be earnest to get the critics, you know. And so Bruce Springsteen is great, but I don't think he's as great as they make out. I think there's a little bit of pretentiousness about that because he is he, able to... It, I, it, he's like one of those acts that the critics love right and he's not a bad musician I'm sure he heard himself is a regular guy he's come out sort of this sort of folk thing and he's got a guitar and he's got some vocal chords and he plays them aggressively and he's got a you know love of rhythm and blues and that's in there when I watch his live shows and he brings out people he does all these nice things and he gets says what songs should we play and he tries to I love all that and I think Bruce is a lovely guy and I think he's a good guy it's not his fault he's overrated, but he is a bit of a critic's darling. There's a whole bunch of these artists, and I never, you know, I always sticks in my throat a little bit, and that's so. So, yeah, I think Bruce Springsteen is overrated. So, what have I got at number one? It's the band that that one guy went over and over again. And what did that comment say? Oasis, 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 Oasis. Oasis emerged in the in this peculiar little scene that happened in the 1990s before rock died. It was the last gasp of, of um, uh, rock music. And it was where rock music combined with sort of football culture and lad culture. And you had what thing called Britpop. And there was bands like Pulp. And there was bands like Bure. And there was Bure. And the Blur. And there was bands like Manson. And there was bands like, you know, all these bands came out. And Oasis came out of that. Now, for me, the great band, the sort of Led Zeppelin or the Beatles of that, period was Blur and Blur went on to make so many and I love Blur and I think Blur are underrated they're very good musicians they're incredible songwriters they're very experimental and an album like 13 which is this sort of proggy psychedelic gospel electronic and stuff is, is equal to a Radiohead but without Radiohead's po facedness Blur an incredible band and when I said Blur were better than Pink Floyd I believe that's the case right uh, David Alburn, you know, when he was a, a, a youngster, as a teenager, he was a pianist. He wrote compositions, and he entered them into the, you know, the the, the young musician of the year, and he won a prize. He was, he's a great. They are serious musicians, right? And um, I, I love Blur. Oasis were, were more the, to me at the time, they were they they got. Um, a very charismatic lead singer that had a unique voice, a, 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 a voice that sells records. You might not like it, but when that voice comes out, that snarl, um, you know, that sells records. And I can remember, um, I think it was Rock and Roll Star, that was the first one I heard, maybe. And I remember thinking, oh, that, that guy's got an image and a voice, and he's got a sort of stance, and that's going to sell records. But this is a pastiche. An absolute pastiche. And a pastiche by sort of working class, you know, British musicians that don't quite know what they're making a pastiche of. This is, you know, working class guys that have sat there getting stoned to the wall by Pink Floyd and Beatles albums and they want to just recreate that and they're going to grab at anything. Um, the lyrics never quite make sense, you know, um, but it's impassioned. Uh, and Oasis were very good at writing songs that could be sung from the football terrace, a bit like Queen. Right, it's a bit like taking Stone Roses. It's a bit like take, taking indie bands like the Lars or um, Chapter House, but infusing them with a sort of football crowd chant, and suddenly you have this, you know, oh, daddy, get away, you know, and if you listen to those lyrics, it sounds like it means something. It doesn't. Don't look back in anger. You know, that's a '60s film. They just say that they don't know what that means. You know, um, let's, let, let's, do, let's do this. Let's do it. Look back in anger. I'm not picking this because I know the um, lyrics are silly. I've got to Google it. I've got to Google it, everybody. But this shows you I do not plan my videos. Are you going to be able to do it? I'm far away from my router now. I uh, can't do it, sorry. That was a waste of time, wasn't it? Anyway, um, Oasis, 
I always thought they were massively overrated. You know, there, there was not much musical content there. They just managed to put some buttons. And then, when I was down on my luck in 2001, um, and I'd finished playing the Robert Plants, you know, and I'd been chucked out of that thing, and I was down on my luck, and I hadn't got a job, and I hadn't got a good gig. I took a, a, a gig, for, and I was lucky to have it because it kept me paying the bills in an Oasis tribute band. I had to learn the songs and start to go out and play them every night. And then I started to like some of those songs and playing the more weirder songs and getting into there. I realised there was there 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 was there see something much greater than you think. Um, I think what it is is that their songs logically hold together as great songs. You know, Wonder Wall. As, as had, I think that's probably had more streams on the internet than Bohemian Rhapsody. It's, you know, people love that song. And it's nonsense. It's like culture. They just grab some, let's, let's just call this one Look Back in Anger because it's a cool 60s film. Didn't um, George Harrison do a weird album called Wonderwall? Yeah, well, let's do an act, call, have a song called Wonderwall. Oh, that'd be a good idea. Let's do that then. And what's it about? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's all nonsense, but it's, it's, I don't know. Are they overrated? Yes, they are, without a doubt. They make about three good albums, and they go downhill, and then they've just existed. And I don't know why. I think it's to be a, the media think of them, you know, the brothers fighting and all that type of stuff, and, and Noel Gallagher and Liam Gallagher being able to go on a chat show and be at least entertaining. I love listening to Noel Gallagher. He talks rubbish, but I love listening to him talk, you know. Um, and he, you know, he, he's one of these like British people, working class, and he, he says it like it is, and we like that, don't we? He, 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 he's down to earth. You find him as you find him, and all that. That's always refreshing. You know, the Beatles had that, and that's what's great. They are overrated. So if we go back to the list, we're at the end of the thing now. I am going to go through that again. Tool, I think they are overrated. Yes, Pearl Jam. Yes, they're overrated. Rolling Stones. Mm, no, I don't think so. Prince, without a doubt, no. ACDC, without a doubt, no, what have it? Um, Led Zeppelin, without a doubt, no. Ready, Red Hot Chili Papers, I can understand that, but for me personally, I absolutely love them and I can't help it. Uh, and, they, it and, and if a band could like pull me out of that jazz snob world, then they're a decent band, right? Um, you two, I think so now. Not if they just stopped playing in 1989, no. Um, they would be a great band. Now, we've gone on for too long, and I think that their, their, their legacy, I'm just trying to explain myself, because I'm not too sure about that one. Bruce Springsteen, again, you know, a good artist, not my cup of tea, and never going to listen to one of his albums, but the critics love him, because he's, it's like good, visceral songwriting, it's authentic, and I hate all that. You know, you know, Queen are the most unauthentic band in history, that's why we love them. Right, and at number one, Oasis. Yeah, I think so. They're a bit overrated, really. So that is the video. There were 10 videos. Hopefully, this time, I won't get all the hate, but I will get all the views. So I'm, I'm, I've changed my approach here. Views, but no hate. You can't blame me. Blame yourselves. You're the one who chose them. Um, I'm pretty sure when the fact that I like some of these bands is going to get me a bit of heat, isn't it? Well, for those people, you know, all I can say is, Anyway, if you like the video, like it and put a like on it. If you want to see more, you can subscribe, ring the notification bell. If um, you want to join my Patreon, and then we now have the Patreon WhatsApp, and there's so much going on, I can't keep up with it. Right, it's not just some Patreon that you're going to go in and twice a week, you're just going to get a photograph of me taking the bins out. It's not that sort of thing. There's so much going on, and you're missing out. You're missing out. You could come and become a free member now. If you become a free member, I'm doing a few posts a couple of times a month, just so you get a vibe of it and see what's going on and see, and see what's happening, right? Um, anyway, um, and I, might, I don't know whether to let the free members become whatsapp because once you got the link you know we could give the link to anybody don't tell anybody this but once you got the link anyone could join it but i am gonna go i've got a couple of moderators and i'll have to tell them that if moderators colin if you're watching that keep an eye about out for hoi polloi if anybody's in there we don't know kick them out ban them chuck them out it's exclusive my patrons exclusive for exclusive musicians who, who, who know their difference between magma and queen right I'm in a Queen mode, but I love Queen. After slating them, I went, I've just ranked them. They're incredible, but anyway, that's another thing. And if you don't want to become a patron, but you still want to support me, and I have now packed my job in, and I am here. I'm here doing this for a living. I've got a few other things on the go, but I'm, I'm now self-employed. I'm doing this for a living. So if you can put a bit of money in the PayPal tip jar, I'll beg you, I'll beg you, please. You know, I am now a digital beggar. 
That's how I, how do I feed my kids? How do I keep my family going? Digital begging. Please, sir, can I have a bit of money, sir? Can I have some more? Anyway, we're done. Thanks, and I'll see you on the next video. Bye.